like one minute. So if you could conclude your fabulous conversings then-ish, it would be awesome. Thank you. I've already heard the volume lower. It's a beautiful thing. Okie dokie. Let's get this party started. Uh, folks, before I actually begin uh, this closing keynote, I would like us all to give a round of applause to the organizers and all the other volunteers who've made FOSM 2009 possible. Also, uh, a big round of applause personally, just because I'm asking, because uh, Philip just had to go home sick and is really unwell and was not here for your applause, so some extra applause for Philip. <laughs> Merci. All right. So, to get started, my name is Leslie Hawthorne, and I'm a program manager for Google's open source team, and I manage the Google Summer of Code program. And today we're going to be taking a look at Google Summer of Code behind the scenes, sort of the internals of the program that all of you folks don't necessarily uh, get a chance to know about as part of the outside world, here revealed at FOSDEM 2009. A bit about me to begin at the beginning. Uh, I come from the fair state of California, shown here in a small red square is in fact the San Francisco Bay Area, where I live. Uh, I also grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, which makes me something of an anomaly in Silicon Valley high tech, given that just about everybody there is a transplant from somewhere else. Uh, I also attended school locally where, uh, at uh, the University of California at Berkeley, where I studied medieval English language and literature. So of course it makes perfect sense that I'm here hanging out with a bunch of free software geeks. Well, they're both about sort of an apprenticeship model in feudalism, right? It was funny, you should laugh now. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So as I said, today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the history of the program, uh, some of the logistics aspects for running the program, as well as uh, lessons learned over time. And specifically, I'm going to take you through my personal journey into the world of free and open source software, and talk about my personal experiences as a community manager for this group of folks. And hopefully this will be useful to those of you who are thinking about doing your own community outreach initiatives to bring in new contributors, and we'll see how it goes. There's gonna be some cute pictures of cats, little gossip, should be lots of laughs, and if not, we can blame that guy right there in the middle who said, Leslie, we want you to come to FOSDEM and give a talk about how you managed to respond to every email you receive within two minutes. So, let's begin at the beginning. A little bit of history. The year is 2005. And this dude, Larry Page, co-founder of Google, is thinking about solving a problem. And this time, Larry's not actually thinking about problems related to internet search. He's thinking about an age-old problem which is that students go to school, they study very, very hard throughout the academic year, and then during the summer they take off, they drink beer, they get jobs that have nothing to do with computer science, computer engineering, or technology, and they begin the academic year again, having lost oh, a quarter of what they learned the year before. And Larry felt like this was a real problem, even from his own days at Stanford. He felt like students were backsliding because they weren't getting employment related to their discipline during the summer. And he felt like this was harming not only their employment opportunities later on, but just computer science as a discipline, right? So Larry thought, okay, we should solve this problem. How should we solve this problem? So, you know, Larry being an American said, I know, let's throw money at it. We have cash. So uh, Larry got together with uh, my boss, Chris Bona, who is the head of open source at Google, and said, all right, we'd like to give you funding for a program to help get students working in computer science over the summer. What are your thoughts? And Chris and Larry and a couple other folks from a couple other different teams sat down and brainstormed, and lo and behold, they came up with the idea for Google Summer of Code. Why not pay students to work to improve free and open source software projects? They get real world software development experience. We can pair them up with a mentor who can actually help them understand how to contribute to their project most effectively. They actually get to work in their field during the summer instead of doing, I don't know, like the job that I did during college, I delivered pizzas. Anybody had to do that? It's not fun, yeah. Or uh, one of our most successful Google Summer of Code students whose only opportunity to work abroad uh, during a summer program was to wash dishes. Again, not fun, not terribly related to computer science. 
So with the informal program motto, flip bits, not burgers, is kind of their watchword. Um, you know, Chris went forth and reached out to his social network, which for those of us who do not speak Web 2.0 means he talked to his friends and uh, said, hey, we've got this idea, we've got some funding, we're wondering, would you guys like to work with some students and you know, mentor them over the summer? We'll pay the students, we'll give you a donation for mentoring, and you guys can find new contributors this way. So about 40 projects signed up, and this was very much an experiment, right? No one had ever done anything like this before. It was open to students worldwide for the most part. Uh, it was you know, not something that anyone had any idea how to actually make happen. And there was no actual infrastructure in place to support the program at this point. So every single thing was done by email from organizations applying to act as mentors, from students saying, hey, I want to participate, I'd like to work with you. So again, very manual process. Um, everything was tracked on the world's largest spreadsheet. Um, I have seen this and repeatedly need to open it, and it takes approximately two minutes. And I wish that none of you ever have to see anything like this as long as you live. So there were some lessons learned, you know, mostly about international finance and taxes. Again, something I hope none of you ever have to deal with. And yet everyone agreed at the end of it, there were some challenges, there were some problems, but this was a game changer, right? The open source projects that were participating really felt like they'd gain new contributors, new ideas, new insights, and they were really excited. They wanted to see it happen again. All right. The year is 2006. And at the very end of March, I joined the open source team as a program coordinator to, you know, make sure that people got, you know, their t-shirts sent to them and to kind of keep order on the mailing list and, you know, all that other good stuff. So I sat down, my first day on the job, and I said, okay, Chris, this whole summer of code thing, what do I do? And the meeting went a little bit something like this. Okay, so you gotta go and talk to the lawyers, right? Because you know, we don't actually collect any contracts from the open source projects that we work with. We do all of this stuff. We just have like a basic terms of service, and that's all we do. And we don't uh, like do any copyright assignments or anything like that. And we have to make sure that the legal team's comfortable with that, because they were comfortable with it last year, but we don't know if they're still comfortable with it. So why don't you go and talk to the lawyers? Oh, and by the way, you need to go and talk to the accountants because I don't know, something about taxes, like we can't withhold taxes or we want to withhold taxes. I, I don't know, there's something about taxes. So you know, make sure you go and talk to the accounting people. And oh yeah, um, we've got this shiny new web application and it's going to, you know, we're gonna take all applications online. Nothing else is gonna be done by email. It's gonna be great. And when people submit evaluations of their students, they can do that online too. It's gonna be awesome. Except it's not really built yet. <laughs> but don't worry, it will be. And, uh, you know, okay, all right, so where can I learn more about the web app? Do we have any documentation? No, we don't really have any documentation. I mean, we got the FAQs, and we've got the mailing list archives. You've looked at those, right? Yeah, I, I read through that already. Okay, yeah, no, we don't have any documentation, but, you know, that's a good idea. We should write some documentation. Why don't you do that? Okay, you got it. No problem. Oh, and, and by the way, you know, in six weeks, we're going to start taking applications from students. And in three weeks, we're going to start taking applications for mentors. And I don't know, a couple of students from the first year, they don't have their tax form or their t-shirt or their certificate. Yeah, a couple of students. And, and uh, you know, we need to get all that fixed before we launch Summer of Code 2006. So make sure you take care of that too. And okay, go. All right. Awesome. I like a challenge. Challenges are great. So there I was jumping into the deep end of the pool. All right, I can take it. Now keep in mind, this number that you're looking at right here is the number of lines of source code I'd read, proprietary or otherwise, when taking this job. This was the number of lines of source code that I had written when taking this job. Um, I now have about 800 lines of Python under my belt. I didn't enjoy it. I am forever grateful that you folks write code so I don't have to. I will always talk to the lawyers so you don't have to. Uh, you know, this is uh, the number of mailing lists external to my company that I had been on when getting this job. You want to get right down to it, this is the number of times I'd used Google Groups. All right, so, you know, here's a more clear picture of the situation. Oh, sorry. So, 
Now, I wasn't totally and completely, you know, unaware of what the whole free and open source software world looked like. I mean, I'd used GNOME. Actually, GNOME was my first introduction to free software. A few years before joining the open source team, a friend of mine was a systems administrator for CollabNet, uh, the company that produces Subversion. And, you know, I was over at his house and I wanted to play some MP3, so I poked at his computer and this weird little icony thing came up and I'm like, what is this lawn sculpture thingy? And he said, no, 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 it's a free desktop operating system, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, so what does this mean? Why does it matter? And he explained to me what free software was and what open source software was and that people were willing to write code and contribute it back to the community for free. Um, and I was like, well, this is really cool. I appreciate that ethic. That's really neat. But I'm not a programmer, so that didn't really matter to me, right? And yeah, I hadn't really used it in about three years. But, you know, hey, I was browsing the web using Firefox, so how much more could there really be to it, right? Can't be that bad. Nah, so it was more like pool, deep end, me out in the ocean about to be smashed on the rocks. But, you know, clearly I didn't drown, right? Here I am. And the program has been immensely successful. Um, for those of you who appreciate charts and bars and uh, general numerics, here's a look at the program over the last four years. Uh, culminating in 2008, which was our biggest offering ever, we had nearly 1,200 students, 175 open source projects, and 83% of our student participants completed their projects to the satisfaction of their mentors and mentoring organizations. So to give you another way to look at this, here's the lovely world. Here are lines connecting all of our students and mentors who participated in Google Summer of Code 2006. The same for 2007, for 2008. Here are all the connections that have been made throughout the world. And this is just actually showing three years of the program. Given that we had no shiny new web application, our data for 2005 is not as beautifully, beautifully visualized. So, what does it take to make this happen? What does it take to bring together people in 98 countries across time zones, language barriers, and help them to you know, get together and write great software? Well, it's not money. Money is not the only answer. It's really the shirt, but we'll get to that later. So it's not shipping out a whole bunch of books on software engineering and software architecture all over the world. It's not getting uh, buried in an avalanche of t-shirts, which uh, actually happens every year. It's not even fighting off killer robots while you're attempting to just ship out checks to people all over the world either. No, it actually takes particular qualities and a particular set of, of skills in a community manager to actually make this happen. So let's talk a little bit about what some of those are. First of all, empathy. Um, you need to be able to put yourself in the shoes of someone who is a brand new contributor who has absolutely no experience and be able to help them through that initial set of hurdles as they're uh, trepidatious and nervous, concerned, kind of not really sure where to turn. And we hear from our mentors in the program frequently that the largest barrier to entry that their students have is simply this nervousness, this fear. They don't, they're not used to communicating in public. They're not, they hesitate to send their patches or their questions to a development mailing list. They don't want to talk in IRC. They'd rather just send private mail to their mentor. And you know the general reason for that is they feel intimidated, right? A lot of these people are on mailing lists with gods of open source. And who wants to look like an idiot in front of your hero, right? We're talking about people like, say, uh, these three gentlemen. The gentleman in the middle, Andrew Trujell, who, in addition to being known for his work on Samba and R-Sync, is actually the most intelligent man in all of Australia. No pressure. Or how about the gentleman in the black shirt sitting down, Brian Aker, the lead architect of MySQL? Again, no pressure. You could be in a really interesting situation where you could be hanging out on a mailing list or in an IRC channel with a gentleman like John Mad Dog Hall, shown seated there playing with his camera. You know, one of the gray beards, one of the people who's been around in computing since the very, very beginning. Again, no pressure. And I could certainly empathize with all of our students who were concerned about this process because I got to be on a mailing list with all of them and embarrass myself. And embarrass myself, I did. Frequently, actually. Now, these of course are just the folks who are uh, community members 
that I was working with during Summer of Code 2006. Let's talk about the folks that I was working with at Google. My boss, former Slashdot editor, you know, the dude who talks about Linux on tech TV. He was sharing an office with the guy who was the chairman of the Apache Software Foundation. And, you know, the couple of engineers on my team early on, they were some of the original developers of Subversion. In fact, at the time, I was sharing a cubicle with this gentleman, Carl Fogel, who, in addition for being known to his work on CVS, is quite literally the guy who wrote the book on producing open source software. No pressure. My friends, there is one word in the English language for this situation. It's intimidating. Actually, there's three words. It's <laughs> so again, remember when you're when you're dealing with brand new contributors, and you know, certainly this advice goes for those of you participating in Google Summer of Code as mentors, but just in general, if you're interested in bringing new people into your project, Remember to be empathetic. Remember that time that you didn't know everything, when this wasn't just you know, something that you didn't even have to think about. And remember what it feels like to be in that situation and think, oh man, anything I do is just going to be a total screw up and I'm totally going to embarrass myself. Again, empathy is key. So what kept me going, right, in the face of really just being intimidating? That thing was curiosity. And I think that that's what you're going to find actually is a great way for you to separate out uh, newbies who come to your project, uh, successful, potential successes from uh, potential time sucks, shall we say, right? Curious people uh, come to your project, they have questions, and everyone starts off with questions, right? And maybe they don't look at things quite the right way, but they want to know more. And knowing what new contributors are worth spending time on is the difference between finding someone who's curious and if you point them in the right direction. For example, go look at this part of the documentation. Check out the comments in this part of the source code. And if they come back to you with useful questions or suggestions or even a patch, probably good potential new contributor. If they come back to you saying, yeah, I read it and I didn't get it and um, can you just like tell me what it says? Probably not so much a good use of time. So my curiosity was actually about these people, right? I'm a people geek. I love knowing how people work. I love knowing what makes them tick, why they get excited about the things that they do. Uh, this picture is actually taken at one of our annual mentor summits. Each year we invite two mentors from each open source project that participated in Summer of Code to come and hang out with us and talk about how to improve the program and also how to improve open source overall. And I really just wanted to know, who are these people? Why do they do what they do? What makes this academic guy who's a professor at Portland State the same thing as that guy who owns his own proprietary software company but works on open source, and that dude who's a game developer, and that guy over there who's like uh, playing the oboe in one of our conference rooms all day to like, you know, get the vibe going on? Why are they here? What do they want? What makes them tick? And how can we help them get more cool stuff done? So needless to say, a role like this requires people skills. And it's not just you know, being able to make people feel good when they're feeling socially awkward, because you yourself have a tendency to be socially awkward. It's not just knowing that you know, your hacker friends like the occasional free beer. That's sort of the obvious. No, what I mean by people skills is the ability to talk to folks from multiple different disciplines, profession, walks of life, and actually be able to understand what they want. So here's an example. This is my typical everyday life. I'm at my housewarming party, and my roommate who works on the FreeBSD project proceeds to you know, bring in guests as they enter the front door and then introduce them to each other, purely based on project affiliation. PCBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD is over there, and like my, uh, yeah, my roommate's the Google Summer of Code chick, and like FreeBSD is in the corner over there, and I think there's one dude from the KDE, and he's over there. Bye. That was it. You know, when I was waiting patiently, I'm like, IRC handle? Anybody? No? These things we call names? No, not happening. And yet, this didn't strike me as all that odd. 
wasn't that big of a deal. Now, my friends, I don't think I need to tell you that this is not what most people would call a normal conversation. Not really, no, not so much. They believe in these things we call names. So you need to be able to be the kind of person who can walk out of that situation feeling completely nonplussed and feel equally comfortable walking into an office with, you know, a team of lawyers and proposing to them some crazy notion that, you know, you want to run this worldwide program for kids to write software and, oh, by the way, you know, we aren't actually going to probably use most of the software that we uh, get written through this and we're going to pay them and we're not going to expect anything back from it. Oh, yeah, and we don't really want to get you know, copyright assignments or, uh, you know, a bunch of contractual stuff because then we'll never actually be able to do this. So, can you make this happen for me? Can you? Now, fortunately, um, our lawyers are paid to say yes, but I can, ima <laughs> <clears throat> I can imagine not all of you will have that good fortune. So uh, this is when your powers of persuasion and your ability to meet someone uh, where they're at and really understand that, say, lawyers are typically paid to be risk averse and understanding that your way of helping them understand how to help you get what you want is to speak to that risk aversion. And then, you know, you need to go into the next room and talk to the accounting people who are really concerned about dollars and cents and the bottom line and uh, who will still never quite understand why you're going to give away all this money to people who are not actually doing anything for you. Can you explain that to me again? Sure. What is this open source thing? I'll explain it to you again, no problem. And finally, they just look at you and go, okay, well, I still don't get it and that's cool, but you know, we need to pay students in a particular method because, you know, well, it used to be that we were using Western Union, but we discovered that their fees were far too high, so now we're gonna pay people using stored value cards, and no, we can't really give you a report about all the payments we made last year because the back-end system to do that isn't where it needs to be, so I hope you kept a spreadsheet of everybody you paid. Yes, thank God. Um, and, you know, by the way, we, uh, we're experimenting with a new payment system and so we'd like your program to be the trial run for that because we figure Summer of Code looks mo the most like paying everybody in the whole world because you've got like 90 countries, right? So you want to help us experiment? Yeah, that'd be great. Let's do it. All right. Then you need to be able to do things like worry about taking care of the people that you care about in meet space, right? Uh, this is a picture of the Googleplex. We host developer conferences there all the time. And you need to be able to talk to folks like your security guards, who really are paid to say no, who are paid to wander around making sure that everyone is not up to no good. And, you know, talk to them and say, hey, guys, so, um, you know, I've, I've got some people coming in and they, they work for, you know, free and open source software projects and they really don't want to execute the NDA. So can we not make them sign the NDA? Oh, no, everyone has to sign the NDA. It's absolutely required that everyone signs the NDA. It's very important that we sign the NDA. But they're not actually going to be anywhere where they could see trade secrets. Well, that's very interesting. I don't know. They really think they still use any. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know that. But, but I promise you they won't actually go anywhere where they're not supposed to go. I know these people. I trust these people. All right, fine. They don't have to sign the NDA, but if you, no, 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 no problem. Don't worry about it. It's going to be all good. And, you know, then there was the, the wonderful, fabulous hurdle of, so, um, Hey, Marty, it's our director of security. Again, the guy who gets paid to be risk averse and say no, just as much as the lawyers, usually. So, uh, you know, we have all these great developer conferences here and it's really cool, so we want everybody to be able to videotape their sessions. Oh, no, 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 nobody gets to videotape anything around Google, it's not okay. But Marty, they're not talking about anything related to Google. Are you sure they're not talking about anything related to Google? I'm positive, this isn't even Google stuff. Well, then why are they here? <laughs> Because we love them and we have extra food and bandwidth that we need to feed to our hacker friends. All right, fine, go ahead, it's fine, right? Just go ahead and do it, just make sure nothing bad happens. Like, yes, score. So if you're gonna be a good community manager, you need to be the kind of person who can talk to all of these people and get them all moving in the same direction. And folks, I assure you, this is not actually easy. But if you're good at it, you make it look easy. And a lot of this is just about being a good listener, right? Actually sitting down and taking the time to communicate with people, talk to them about what their concerns are, talk to them about their constraints, talk to them about what their needs are. And not only just listen, but take the time to understand their motivations, right? Why 
is this dude worried about someone videotaping a session? Well, he's worried that, you know, Google trade secrets are going to leak out onto the interwebs. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, why are our lawyers worried about copyright assignment? Well, they're worried that we might get sued, but that's not going to happen. And if you can actually make a plan that speaks to everyone's motivations, then you actually achieve, you know, you get consensus, you get success, and life is good. You'll find that when you do this, you're actually becoming a connector. What you're doing is you're taking the opportunity to understand members of your community, be that, you know, your legal team, your accountants, or in your case, other folks in your free and open source software project, and you'll know, you'll be able to best assess the strengths and weaknesses of all your participants. And you'll know whom to connect with whom if you want to get things done. In the case of bringing in new participants, it may be that you have somebody who's just totally solid and brilliant technically, right? And they don't necessarily have a lot of patience, say, for newbie questions. This is not someone to pair with a newbie. It's not a good idea. On the other hand, you might have someone who's incredibly enthusiastic about you know, bringing in new contributors, someone who really likes teaching, someone who really likes mentoring. And yet, they're not necessarily the right person to pair up with someone who's looking to enhance their technical skill set in a particular area. And that's when you, make, you, know, you go ahead and you make the call. Who do, I put, how, who do I put together to make good stuff happen and to get good stuff done? All right, another thing that happens when you uh, want to be a good community manager and you actually want to do you know, outreach initiatives within your group, you have to be scrappy. And by scrappy, I mean you need to be resourceful. You need to do more with less. You need to think about creative ways to use extremely limited resources to get stuff done. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, we did a program for high school students to get them involved in open source. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But we had no way to actually manage um, the program that we wanted to do. So uh, we just you know, sort of used the Google Code Issue Tracker because it was there and we could make notes and it you know, actually tracked everything. You know, almost killed a couple people, but that's all right. <clears throat> so that being said, you know, I tell people that, you know, at Google we believe in doing more with less. And people look at me and go, nah, yeah, yeah. you're a big multinational corporation. You got lots and lots of money. You don't have to do more with less. And I go, oh, no, no. This, this she is not true. This is the number of people on Google's open source team. So this is the number of people at Google, a uh, 20,000 person company who are responsible for all open source stuff. Nine people. Of those nine people, three, uh, shown here in front of the awesome Android statue, uh, myself, shown here actual size, Kat Allman, shown there actual size, and she's going to stand up or I'm going to biff. Will the real Kat Allman please stand up? Thank you very much. And uh, the lovely Miss Ellen Coe, a recent addition to our team, we're responsible for all of the people-oriented stuff that Google does around uh, open source software. So that's Google Summer of Code. That is our uh, high school program, the Google Highly Open Participation Contest. That is all of the news about the events we run, the code we release, and all the stuff that we're doing in the wider world of open source software uh, on the Google Open Source blog. And we're also responsible for hosting all of those wonderful events when people come to our campus and hang out with us and hack and get stuff done. So, like I said, it's all about doing more with less. Now, it shouldn't surprise you that that's the case because really our team is focused on getting code released, right? And making sure that when we do big open source projects like Android, they're done right. And you know, correctly in, ter in terms of licensing, right? And what that basically means is when we're talking, oh, sorry. We have had released 212 projects, thousands of lines of code, it's very exciting. Um, and basically what that means is we get 25% of an engineer for this program on a good day. The system that we've been using as infrastructure has built, been built almost entirely by interns. Um, it's not maintained when the program is not in session. We get to experience the joys of bit rot. How many of you here have experienced the joys of the current Google Summer of Code web application? How many years did it take off your life? <laughs> Two, three, five, yeah, 10. There you go. So. Uh, needless to say, as we would not like to shorten the lifespan of our friends, we came up with a great solution to this problem, which was also a great solution to another problem, which is folks would consistently come to us and say, we think Summer of Code is great. We want to run our own grant program. We'd really like to take your code and your infrastructure and reuse it. And we had to say, well, 
Uh, it's entirely dependent on Google infrastructure. We can't help you. And now we have the lovely Melange project. Yes, it's named after the spice that extends life and consciousness, since we knew we were taking years off your life in the first place. Um, that is a cool picture of Connect the Dots Paul Atreides, I like. So fortunately, we are going to be talking a bit more about Melange and how you folks could use it as well, if you'd like. This is the first open source project that Google's done in the open from Commit One. So if you're interested in doing your own newbie outreach program, you can take that code and make use of it. But for now, I will uh, beg your patience. Patience, another key aspect of dealing with a newbie. So, um, and I, I consistently get asked by folks, like, how do you manage to not, like, go nuts with all of the stupid question emails you get? And, and, and it is hard, you know, because you get asked the same question over and over and over and over, and sometimes it looks a little different, but it's basically the same question, and it's in the same thread, and usually it's someone exploring some corner case that has nothing to do with reality, like, well, I'd really like to do part of my project from Tajikistan, and I'd like to do part of my project from the Canary Islands, and then I'd like to do part of my project from New York, and then after that I thought I'd like, you know, I don't know, not submit my code at the end. Can I still pass? No. Really, no. Not gonna, not gonna happen, right? So needless to say, situations like these are going to cause even the best of us a small amount of frustration, a little bit of consternation. In fact, it may even cause you to think, my God, do I need to schedule you for an appointment with a clue bat. But, you know, that's, that's when you take your moment to, to relax, to repent, reflect, reboot, to enhance your patience. You do not scream RTFM. You may think it really loudly, but you do not actually say it. And this is for a couple of reasons. One, um, believe it or not, this phrase is completely non-helpful, folks. Um, you know, there were many occasions as I started off on this wonderful journey when perhaps there was no M for me to read. Uh, there were times when I would go and ask Google before asking dumb questions. And since I had absolutely no idea where to start, all the search results that came back to me were utterly useless. Um, and another thing to realize is this is a great answer to someone who looks just like you, who acts just like you. If you're already here, if you're already involved in free and open source software, you are the kind of person who's gonna go and dig your hands in deep and you're gonna figure it out no matter what and you're gonna push on it and you're gonna bang on it until you have an answer. And if we're trying to bring more people in, if we're trying to bring in new ideas and fresh perspectives, those people aren't already here. If they already were going to just benefit from an answer like this, we would have already found them. So this doesn't actually help us bring new people in. And that is a bad and sad thing. And the other reason why this is, is not really such a good thing to say is you have to figure you're not just looking for the new inexperienced contributor who is going to go I run, uh, and run away screaming like a scared bunny. How about the experienced contributor, someone who actually knows how to program already, someone who actually knows how your system works because they've already checked out your source code and figured it all out? What happens when they come and try and engage with your community and they hang out in your IRC channel and everyone's being kind of catty to each other and you know, saying stuff like that? What's gonna happen when they look through your list archive and they're like, whoa, Flame Fest Central. This is not always a compelling strategy to get someone to spend their free time writing your free software. So therefore, I recommend patience, gentleness, and you know, you will have to repeat the same answer to the same dumb question over and over and over again. And that is okay, cast a wide net, see what comes back, the investment, I assure you, is worthwhile. Uh, be available. If you're looking to bring new people into your community, you really need to be available. And what I mean by be available is you need to be there to answer questions and really motivate things along. Um, I know when I uh, joined the uh, Open Source Programs Office in 2006, um, I was highly available. I was getting about four hours of sleep a night. I was literally responding to every email within two minutes of receiving it. Um, I was in IRC constantly. And you know, it has gotten a lot better since then, and that is a good and beautiful thing. But the point is, I wanted to be there to facilitate, to make sure people had the information that they needed to be successful. And that's really what being available is about. Um, and I don't know, uh, I don't know too many people who when they send their, hey, I'm on vacation mail, it goes to this number of people. Maybe some of you in the audience, this is the case. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, you, you can't scale infinitely, 
But if you're really interested in being new pro bringing new people into your project, you need to make yourself available. And yes, it's a lot of work. I assure you it's worthwhile. And if I did it, so can you. What you're going to find when you're uh, doing something that's incredibly successful is you're going to end up inspiring people. They're going to look at what you're doing, and they're going to want to do something a lot like it, just like it. Um, I've personally talked to numerous projects who have participated in Summer of Code or have just looked at the Summer of Code model and said, oh my gosh, we love what you're doing. How do we do something just like it? And it's anything from, say, uh, the Open Medical Record System project that uh, started participating in Summer of Code in 2007. They were making a database for medical records, and it was all to be deployed within the developing world, specifically focusing on patients who had AIDS. And they came to me and they're like, we have no developers in Africa. Our software is being deployed in Africa. We think this is a bad thing. What do we do to solve this problem? So, you know, I sat down and hashed out with them a couple of different ideas, and in fact, their first uh, externship program was immensely successful. Or, say, talking to the OLPC folks about their summer of content project and how I, they, you know, stop, behave. Um, oh, that's somebody, oh, sorry. My bad. Anyway, so talking to the OLPC folks about their summer of content project, and you know they were trying to get content created for the XO laptop in like, you know, I don't know what was it. In three months, we want to get like a thousand different documents in at least fifteen different languages, and how do we make this happen? And we want to use the summer of code model, and how do we figure out how to pay people? And and that was a very long and interesting meeting about workarounds for the vagaries of international finance. Let me tell you. I mentioned that I was going to talk about this before. Sometimes you can even take a moment to inspire yourself. Um, I've been working on Summer of Code for two years, and I was really excited about it, but I thought, I want to do something new. I want to do something that has a, a greater impact, a larger outreach. And Summer of Code is awesome because it gets college and university students you know, involved in this world, but by the time you get to college, isn't it already a little too late? I mean, what if your college doesn't do anything open source? You're going to, have to, you're going to spend a lot of time you know, fighting to actually be able to work on this stuff. What if we get you, get you while you're even younger? Why not? So we came up with the idea for the Google Highly Open Participation Contest. So we went to 10 different open source projects and we said, hey, um, do you have a lot of stuff that you want to get done that no one ever gets to that's kind of like bite-sized work? And they said, yeah, we have a ton of stuff like that. I'm like, okay, great. Make me a task list. Make me a to-do list. Your dream stuff that you all want to get done and no one has time to work on it. You know, don't make it too difficult, right? Like, yeah, rewrite my entire file system. No, not so much that. And, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll fund high school students, secondary schoolers, to work on this. And in two months, we had 350 kids, 40 countries, a thousand of these little bite-sized chunks of work done. That was amazing. Um, do we have any Google Highly Open Participation Contest students here? Ah, we have one mentor there. I heard there was a girl from Holland who is a participant. Where? I am pointing. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> Real success shown actual size. All right. Um, I think probably one of the most essential aspects of being a good community manager and bringing in newbies is uh, humility and. I don't just mean humility in the sense of not being overly convinced of your own self-worth. Um, I also mean humility in a very different way. And uh, I will explain to you what I mean. This is humility of knowing when you know too much. So this lovely poster resides in the window of a local restaurant that uh, I frequent called El Pollo Loco, which for my friends who are not Spanish language enabled means the crazy chicken. Shockingly enough, these guys serve chicken. And I was walking up one night to get dinner, and I went, hey, we cater. This is good. I like having friends over. We like chicken. Maybe I don't have to cook. That's not so bad. I can make my vegetarian friends some hummus. We're good. And then I went, 188 EPL to go. And I literally just stopped in the middle of the parking lot and went, what? EPL. What does the Eclipse public license have to do with chicken? What? I, oh, yeah, El Pollo Loco. Oh, yeah, got it. OK. And that was when I knew. I was never going to effectively be able to look at anything with the eyes of a newbie, not when my initial reaction to something that is 
clearly has nothing to do with technology, was a technical response, right? And so sometimes, if you're working with someone who has no experience and you're trying really hard to explain something to them and you know that they're just not getting it and you know that they're enthusiastic and they are a good use of time, sometimes you need to be humble enough to step back and say, I'm not the right person to help you. I can't see this problem in a way that I can explain it to you that will be useful to you. And then stepping back and uh, connecting them with the right person. That being said, there is also that whole ego thing. Um, ego is, is sometimes rampant uh, among our kind, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time touching on that. But I think that there is something else to be said about ego in a completely different fashion, and that is um, not thinking enough of one's own accomplishments, right? Not having any ego at all. Uh, like I said, when I first started off uh, you know, in Summer of Code, I had no experience. I had no idea what I was doing. And frankly, it wasn't like there was any template or model for me to work from, because no one had ever done it before. And what we were doing changed almost completely from 2005 to 2006 in terms of workflow. And so you know, people would come to me, and they'd say, oh my gosh, you're doing a great job. You know, This is really cool. And I'd say, eh, <laughs> thanks, I try. And I didn't believe them. And then eventually, I did it for a while. And I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. And I did believe them. But you know, there were a lot of, you know, kind of egotistical people out there, and I thought, you know, I don't, I don't want to be one of those people running around being very overly excited about what I accomplished. So people would give me compliments, and I'd go, oh, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's cool. Like, no, anybody could do this. Yeah, no, it's, it's fine. And, you know, that's not necessarily good either, right? Um, I, know, uh, I know a fair number of folks who are involved in community stuff who, who have that kind of reaction, and... Uh, we have formed the Mutual Adoration Society to help ourselves get over that. And I think the really profound moment for me was one day I was sitting there talking to my friend Dave, uh, D. Anderson and Pound GSSC. Anyone know who I'm talking about? Oh, you guys do not spend enough time in our IRC channel. Come on down. We're nice. We're friendly. We serve, you know, cookies. And I was, you know, Dave was telling me, you know, oh, you know, you're doing great. And I'm like, nah. He's like, well... Leslie, you know, you need to respect yourself and your accomplishments. And I said, you know, Dave, I don't want to be one of those people who runs around being overly pleased with themselves. And he's like, Leslie, humility is great. Don't deny the awesome. And I went, and I hemmed and hawed. And he said, no, Leslie, humility is great. Don't deny the awesome. And so I looked at him and I thought about it and I'm like, you know what, Dave, that's really, really good advice. I appreciate that. Where did, where'd you hear that? And he's like, yeah, don't you remember when you told me that? I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, now I do. And uh, that was the best experience I ever had of someone quoting my own advice back to me. It's quite good. You'll find as, you know, you're new. <laughs> I love cats. Um, You'll find as you're working with newbies and kind of, you know, pulling them through the whole process and getting them onboarded that eventually they'll begin to feel confidence, right? And as they feel more and more confidence, they'll need less and less of your time to make them productive contributors, right? And for me, myself, as I got more and more experience, I too got more and more confidence. And if you're a community manager, again, confidence is one of those essential aspects, right? You need to be the person who's there to lead the charge in matters that are non-technical. In matters that are technical, it's pretty clear on a lot of times you know, what the answer should be. This patch caused regressions, maybe not so much. Uh, implementing a feature this way is going to cause a performance problem, maybe not so much. In matters that aren't te necessarily technical, aren't necessarily measurable, this is where a community manager comes in and just makes a decision, right? I think that we should market our uh, you know, latest event this way. I think that we should structure our program timeline this way. And you need to just step out, make a decision, and not only that, but have the confidence to know that you are going to make mistakes. You are probably going to make a lot of mistakes. In fact, I guarantee you that you will make a lot of mistakes, and that's okay. You just need to have the confidence to know that you're gonna be able to do it, and that course corrections are a good thing, when needed. Um, I haven't talked uh, anything about this yet, but I'm hoping it's coming through in uh, my articulation. If you want to bring new people into your project, you need to have passion. Um, I am incredibly passionate about what I do. I cannot imagine having a more awesome job. I get paid to help students learn more about what they're really passionate about, to become better computer scientists, to get 
their awesome dream jobs. I get cool mails like, hey, Leslie, I just graduated from college, and I just got married, and I used my summer of code money for my wedding, and I hope you can come. Whoa, dude. This is not, you know, these are not experiences that I think most people get to have. And, and you know, what really helps me be passionate is, is those experiences and the, the awesome community of folks that I get to interact with, right? And the cool thing about that passion is that passion is infectious. That enthusiasm really draws people in. They want to know what it is that makes you so excited. They want to be a part of it, right? So have your passion, feel your love, and display that passion. And last but not least, know when to ask for help. Um, I know, like I said, first year, summer of code, getting about four hours of sleep a night, it was not fun. And that was mostly because I, I didn't know anybody, right? I, you know, I had no idea who all these people were. And after a while, as I was reading more posts on the mailing list and spending more time in our IRC channel and really getting to know people, I'm like, okay, has clue, has clue, reliable, has clue, judicious, patient. You're the kind of person who's going to get cranky later, maybe not so much with you. And you know, and these are the kinds of people who, you know, when there was a flame war starting on the mailing list and maybe it wasn't the best time for me to step in, I'm like, hey, dude, yep, got it. You know, our second year, we had eight channel ops who weren't Googlers in our IRC channel. Um, I asked the community to work with me to create documentation about advice for mentoring organizations and advice for students that we published as a resource for the program, even though it's Google's program, because guess what? I can't give good advice as a mentor or a student. I haven't been one. And uh, speaking of asking for help, we're going back to that lovely little picture of, you know, Paul Atreides, my hero. So, Melange. The Melange project, as I said before, is the next generation framework to manage the Google Summer of Code program. And uh, we went out and asked the community for help and contributions because, as I said, we have about 25% of an engineer on a good day. Um, and we were really excited when we were actually able to take this project and make it a community-owned and community-driven project just about a month ago. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Pavel Soyega. I've pronounced it wrong again, didn't I? I'm terrible. Ladies and gentlemen, Pavel Soyega. Uh, Two-time Google Summer of Code student, one-time mentor for his own mentoring organization, and the gentleman who got the job washing dishes overseas instead of writing uh, free and open source software. And he's going to give you a demo of some of the features of Melange, so if you want to do your own newbie outreach initiatives or externship programs, you can see what the code base looks like and see what you want to do with it. Or you might want to contribute, because it's in Python and Django, and we have this shiny new web application, but it's not really done yet. Just a thought. Um, you don't want a mic? You don't have to have the mic. Okay. okay. Okay, guys. I'll just do a quick demo what we have so far in, in Melange. Uh, the resolution is not really uh, great. Okay. One second. Why don't you just show them how to create a new organization? Uh, yeah, so one second because I have it. Yeah. One moment, please. We are experiencing technical difficulties, and if they continue for a long period of time, I will annoy you with close harmony singing. Okay, that should work. Okay, okay so I will sign out. I can Welcome to our sexy, sexy home Sign page. in. So I'm working right now locally. It's not deployed to any Google App Engine uh, servers right now. I'll just sign in as user 10. That's ambitious. Yes. And I see the home page. And I can create my profile. And I can type in my public name, which is user 10, of course, and user link ID, which will show up in the URLs. This is actually really, really cool, because with our old infrastructure, every year you had to answer the same data over and over and over again. You don't got it anymore. It's good. So we can have many Google Summer of Code projects in the same web application. And we can have uh, G-Hub uh, projects, um, programs too, in the, in the same application at the same time. So if you're interested in doing a program of your own, you can either have a uh, proposal-based workflow, a per-project workflow, or you could also have a task-based workflow, like, you know, do this one little small thing for me, okay, it's done. So depending on how you want to work your magic. Yep. So here is the, what user, normal user sees. 
Uh, the user doesn't have any roles yet, like he's not an organization administrator, he's not a mentor or a student, anything. So basically it's just a pure user, site-wide user. And now I'm gonna sign out as a user uh, and sign in as a administrator of the, of the melange. And now I see a lot more, right? So I have user as me. I have the site settings where I can edit site settings. I can place Google Analytics, Google Maps API. I can set the home page document. If I have some documents, I can just type in and my nice auto completion shows up and I can Very select simple. the document. I can set the feed URL that will show up on the uh, main web page. I can set the terms of service for both programs and, and the sidewide terms of service if it's needed. Uh, I can, you guys may not even want to bother with for your own stuff, but yeah. it's useful for you know, large organizations. We can, yep. we can create uh, the documents inside Melange, uh, which we can then reuse. For example, in site settings, we can set up this document as a home page. So for those of you who are actually participating in Summer of Code right now, do you know how we have documentation in like seven different places? This is the part where you nod. We aren't going to have documentation in seven different places anymore. And if you want to use this software, you won't have to have that happen to you either. Yep, so we can, what else we can do? We can list users. That's, also, that's only for the admins, but we can list users and go through them if they need to. Uh, what else do we have? I think, I think the chickens are restless. Yeah, well, yeah. OK, so we have a few terms that need to be explained. We have program owner, which is a sponsor of the program, basically, like Google is a program owner. We can create a new program owner inside the application. We have one already created here, this program owners. Hey, this is Google program. Google is a program owner here. It's created by false them test user. Uh, and the program owners can include uh, program administrators. So we can invite some user to become a program administrator. Why don't we show them how to apply to become an organization, since that's probably what most people are interested in. Oh, you can apply a, to become an organization. Shown here, actual size, mentoring yeah, so organization this, applications. Yeah, basically you see the form. Uh, once you click Submit, Leslie can review the organization applications. She can go and list. Authors. And for those of you who are actually planning on applying as mentoring organizations to Google Summer of Code, all those questions that we're scrolling by really fast are all the same questions you've had to answer for the past two years, so no big surprises there. Yeah, we can list the programs that are currently uh, in the system and we can edit the program if we, if we need to or we can create a new program. No, wait. Uh, so you can actually have multiple programs running on the same instance if you wanted to do two parallel programs at the same time, which so, is pretty cool. Yeah, so I want to create a new program. I can select the program owner. And anyway, the point is that it's really cool and awesome and shiny, and you will be getting to use this if you are a Summer of Code participant this year, and uh, you know, if you would like to contribute to the project, we would always love your help. Yep, and that's basically, that's it. Thank and you, we are awesome. looking for new contributors. If you know Python, Django, CSS, JavaScript, or HTML, we are looking for help. Yay. View. Tools. Oh, yeah. Feel the full screen love. All right, folks, in case you haven't figured it out, yes, we are doing Google Summer of Code 2009. There is the sexy new logo for this year. It's very pretty. Harkens back to the whole summer of love. We like. Uh, and we will be taking student applications on the 23rd of March of 2009. So we will be creating all the functionality required in Melange to take student applications, which isn't necessarily there now, but fortunately we can reuse a lot of the code. Uh, if you would like to learn more about applying as a mentoring organization or about applying as a student, our FAQs for 2009 will be published tomorrow uh, at code.google.com slash SOC. There's where to find out more about Melange, where to find out more about open source at Google, and check out the blog. We spend a lot of time writing for it, and you know, we would love it if you would come read it. And that's all I got. Any questions? Question.
Hi, hello. So, a lot of the Linux users group within Scotland have been wanting to do what you've done with high schools. Mm -hmm. how, how do we go around doing that? How do we get high school kids to start working on open source software? Okay, uh, that's an awesome question. So, the gentleman's question was that there are a lot of Linux users groups in Scotland and they'd like to take what we've done with high school students and replicate that model. So, how do you get high school students involved in uh, free and open source software development? Um, I would say that there are a couple different ways to do this. One, start really, really small. When you're asking people to do things, make tasks discreet and make them something that you can accomplish with a couple of hours of effort. And one of the reasons you want to do that is, uh, let's face it, we all have the attention span of a gnat. High school students are no different. And the other reason you want to do that is you want to give these students a sense of accomplishment, right? This is a, it, it's a very big world out there, and it can be scary if you've never done it before, and you still are very much entrenched in the idea of seeing adults as authority figures. And if you can actually prove that you can do something, if you can have that sense of accomplishment, if you can go back and say, I've done this work and it was successful, then you're actually going to find that that is what, uh, you know, creates more energy and actually gets more people involved. The other thing is, don't give up right at first. I mean, I, I had no clue, again, what I was doing uh, with the Highly Open Participation Contest. I just said, hey, let's get some high school kids working on open source projects. That sounds awesome. And I also thought, where do they meet? I don't know where to find them. I don't want to use Facebook. Well, hopefully our friends will find them. And that actually happened, but you'll find that your momentum builds up more after a couple people get stuff done. And then all of a sudden, you're going to get a flood of people going, oh my god, this is so cool, this is so cool. I really, 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 really want to do it. But at first, it's going to be like, Radio silence. And if you would like to get some expert advice on this topic, we have a high school student contributor right over there who might wish to uh, provide you with some guidance, or we can have a beer later and discuss ways to improve our mutual offerings. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Throwing a rotten fruit? I have fruit to throw back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 